Hi everybody, uh, my name is Alex from Be My App. Uh, I'm organizing this uh, uh, webinar session to help you, uh, uh, to support you uh, on the um, Intel RealSense app challenge. So basically I'm, I'm here with uh, Eric and the whole Intel team uh, that uh, uh, would be able to uh, answer all your questions today. So this is the fourth and the last session we are having for the challenge. So don't be shy, guys. Go on, ask question. Ask all the question you have. Uh, uh, this is the, the final row. Okay. So um, yeah, feel free to ask a question. This session is actually going to be recorded. Okay. We will put it uh, online afterwards. But uh, yes, um, we have. We're gonna go for uh, an hour of uh, uh, presentation. Eric, are you here with us? Yep, ready to go. Great. All right, so folks, welcome to the webinar. As we mentioned, that uh, this is a, a second webinar that we have done, uh, and so some of you may be coming back from the, from the first webinar we did. Uh, for those of you that are coming back, welcome back. You know the you know the game plan here. If you guys have questions, there's a Q&A box there. Just go ahead and start firing the questions as we go along, and we'll try to get those answered as, as we proceed. For those of you who haven't, didn't come to the first webinar, who's a, this is your first webinar, we're, we've got a few slides of documentation here, and then from there we'll, uh, we'll kind of get into uh, the Q&A that will happen in, inevitably. So uh, with that, I think we're going to go into this. A little bit about me. Yes, I am the uh, the community manager, the evangelist for Intel RealSense uh, in terms of de developer outreach. And uh, I used to be in the Navy, and I have uh, a Twitter account. I know it's very impressive. Nobody has Twitter, but uh, so just in case you weren't wondering what I look like. <clears throat> but more importantly, what are we here to try and accomplish? As we we've, we've probably heard a few times and seen a few emails, right? We do have the Intel RealSense App Challenge 2014 going on right now. And we are really eager to get some of, at least some of the developers to be able to submit some rapid prototypes between now and December 17th. So what we want to do here is offer these webinars. We did the first one last week, and this is our second one. So to give you folks an opportunity to try and get some direct feedback, some direct answers on some of the questions that you might have if you wanted to get some little bit uh, extra help or we're running into some roadblocks or something. We wanted to give this as an opportunity. So obviously one thing is we want to get you guys the knowledge that you need to be productive and be able to finish your your apps, like I said, your rapid prototypes before the December 17th deadline. And obviously after that, continue to work on them until the final deadline to, to make sure that you, you get the best possible app or game into the challenge to maximize your chances of winning some of those cool prizes. And then, speaking of cool prizes, the other thing we're hoping to do is get you guys excited, right? Because we do have this wonderful rapid app prototype supplement, su supplement here, right? So we have the ability to, to win prizes all outside of the grand prizes just by getting your, your apps and games in early. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish. For those of you that, uh, for this, this first webinar, those of you who were in the first one, uh, this will be redundant, I apologize, but uh, what we're really trying to talk about here is when we talk about Intel RealSense, we're talking about this as being the next logical evolution in how people will interact with computers. When you go back and look at science fiction shows like Star Trek or Star Wars or most any of the shows in the last 20, 30 years, you don't often see them even touching a keyboard, let alone a mouse. Sometimes you might have touch screens. Very often, people interacted much more naturally with computers, right? You had the, for example, in the Star Trek Next Generation, some of the others, you had things like the holodeck where people could actually interact quite directly. Now, obviously, we're not quite at the range of the holodeck, but if you look on this screen, we've gone from being able to just type words to clicking on mice to touching screens, and now we're going to get to the point where you can actually interact directly, right, where you can wave your hands in the air like you just don't care, or you do care, whichever it may be, and the computer, thanks to the software you guys are going to be developing, will be able to interact with users and so they can do all kinds of things. Something as simple as for years and years and years when you wanted to do the computer to do something or not do something, it would add up, it would do a pop-up and say, do you want me to proceed, okay, or cancel, right? 
wouldn't it be great if you could just nod or shake your head, right? I mean, every child in the world, at least that I've ever met, knows how to shake their head or nod their head. Why do we have to have an okay or cancel, right? If just being able to nod and shake your hands would be so much more simpler. And these are the types of things we're getting people excited about now. Uh, the first versions will be coming out on Windows 8.1. Android will be coming out later on in 2015. There'll be different versions of the real sense. But for the stuff that you guys are working on, this is the front-facing, user-facing cameras working on Windows. And we'll go through some details here in a second. There we go. Uh, just so you guys have a full background, right, this whole Intel RealSense effort is part of a very large effort for us. We don't just have the one that you see here in the middle, right, which is the the face, the front-facing camera that you guys are working on, but we also have a rear-facing camera coming down the road, and even this other technology known as Intel RealSense Snapshot, which doesn't allow for gestures and whatnot, but does allow for some pretty cool, interesting post-processing of pictures, right, being able to actually see how tall your child is every time you take their picture. Uh, the, the whole, when I was a kid, right, every birthday we'd stand up very tall on the door frame and get our, our height measured. Now every time you take your child's picture, you know exactly how tall he or she is in every picture. So, sorry door frame, those days are going away. So, th we, we have a very large effort coming out here and uh, this, this first one here in the middle is the one that we're talking about today because that's the one that the app challenge is uh, dependent on. So the other aspect to be aware of is that when you guys are, are working in your apps or your games, it's not just about getting into this challenge, right? You have a wonderful opportunity to be one of the very first people, first few thousand people to be very blunt and honest in the entire world that will get access to this Intel RealSense 3D camera. Right? This is the actual board. That's the U.S. quarter right there. You can see how small the actual board that, that Intel has designed is, is. And this is a board that we're having manufactured and sent off to all kinds of OEMs, especially the seven in the list below, Asus, Acer, NEC, Dell, HP, Fujitsu, and Lenovo. These are all come out and publicly agreed that they uh, will loud and proudly be making Intel RealSense um, Intel RealSense systems, right, or systems with Intel RealSense built into them. And, and this is why. You can see how small the board is. So it's going to be able to fit into the actual bezel of all-in-ones and two-in-ones and laptops and ultrabooks and whatever else it may be. So this is going to be a very large market, and you guys, like I said, literally are, are, are part of the very first, no more than 2,000 people that, that get their hands on this, these cameras. So you have a significant advantage into, a, into the marketplace. If, uh, if you hadn't read the documentation yet or haven't been able to get through all of it, some just broad sweeping generalities about the camera. It works on roughly a range of somewhere between 20 centimeters or 8 inches to about 120 centimeters or 4 feet. Uh, the gesture is a little bit shorter, right? It should be more like 20 centimeters to 60 centimeters or 8 inches to about 2 feet. But still, it's a pretty good range and volume. The conical dimensions of the of the depth sensor is 55 degrees horizontally and 70 degrees left to right. Some other details, right, the RGB part of the camera is a full 20, 20, uh, sorry, 1080p RGB camera. It does require a full USB 3 interface and you do need the fourth generation Intel Core processor which was codenamed Haswell while running 8.1. Um, so we're getting some questions coming in, and it looks like Colleen is doing a pretty good job of answering them. Uh, Colleen or Megna, if you guys get a question that uh, needs further discussion, feel free to chime in and, and bring them up here. So specifically, what we're expecting people to be able to accomplish with the Intel RealSense Software Development Kit, or SDK, is we really think there's four main kinds of interactions, right? Your hands, your face, your speech, and your environment. Specifically, from a hand standpoint, there will be 22 points of articulation per hand, up to two hands. It can be left and right, it can be left and left, right and right. Um, myself and Colleen can play rock, paper, scissors against each other if we want. Facial recognitions will be 78 landmark points. We have a few pictures to support that later. And uh, we're working on trying to do things like emotion react, uh, recognition, which is, uh, as you can imagine, somewhat of a difficult thing. And it can even do things like pulse estimation, right? So it knows your heart rate. Speech recognition is built into this because it's part of natu interacting naturally. 
And in terms of object scanning and things of that nature, that is still an area that we're working on bringing to full completion. We expect it will be out in the full SDK uh, early in 2015, hopefully around January or so. So in terms of what the SDK itself can do, uh, we've already talked about the fourth generation NUCO processor, the Windows 8.1. The languages we support are C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, and Java. We have gotten several feedbacks from other people about other languages that they'd like to support. We've sent that back to the development team, and they're going to work to try and add more languages down the road, which for now that's where we're starting with. In terms of your development environments, we support both Visual Studio and Eclipse. And also, if you look under development tools, Unity, which is in many ways more of a development environment than anything else. We also support things like Havoc and the Intel Media SDK and the entire rest of the list that's down here. When you look at some of the other aspects of it, right, we are saying that at this point we believe that multiple applications will be able to access data from the camera simultaneously. That's at least the plan. And you can also use different modalities at the same time. So, for example, you can do things like uh, do both facial recognition and gesture recognition all at the same time. There was a question that got asked from Terrence here, and it was, uh, are we able to define our own gestures? And the answer is, as Colleen said, is yes. Uh, we do have the ability to, for you to start to work on that. It is definitely an area that uh, we're going to continue to improve on. It's not a trivial thing to make your own gestures, but it is something that we have been planning for people to be able to support, and uh, it, will, it will be getting better over time. In terms of the area that we think people are most likely to be developing for, there are five main parts here, right? Capture and share in terms of being able to do all kinds of collaboration and whatnot, uh, scanning an object like, a, in this case, a bird and whatnot, and be able to put it into a 3D modeling tool, like maybe, say, Blender, and then maybe even print it back out using a 3D printer. In terms of uh, cre creativity here, it's the ability to remove backgrounds, right? So you can do video calls and whatnot and remove the background of where you're actually at. And instead of have that background of your office or wherever it is, actually put the, the topic you're talking about, in this case, a patio. Interacting naturally is the obvious one, right? Be able to just nod your head, shake your head, um, whatever gestures you might do, hold up a number of fingers for the, the, you, the choice that you want to make. Obviously, games and whatnot are always going to be in there, and even things like edutainment, right? So one example might be a situation where people, a child could be reading a book, and as they read the book, the, the app would actually animate the story. And let's say it was Jack and the Beanstalk, and then if the child stops reading, Jack will just sort of stop and start to look at them and maybe tap his foot, like, you know, keep going. So uh, we do have a slide that I'll, I'll get to later about some of the emotions that we, we're trying to work on, Diego. So uh, just sit tight for a little bit. We'll try to run into that real quick. Uh, the other question was, do we support non-Windows and non-Intel platforms? Obviously, we're not going to support non-Intel platforms. It is the Intel RealSense technology that is built explicitly for our our processors, uh, to be quite blunt, it's uh, <laughs> it's designed for our processors. We have very, very, very good processors, and uh, you need to have a tremendous amount of processing power to to perform on such a large amount of data. When you look at the the volume that you're dealing with in terms of not only having a ten, full 1080p RGB, but also having a depth volume for all that stuff, that is actually, from a mathematical standpoint, a tremendous amount of data that you're crunching. And quite frankly, other processors just wouldn't be able to handle it. And in terms of non-Windows, as I mentioned, for some of the other real sensors coming down the road, there will be support for Android. But uh, yeah, for right now, the ones that you guys are working on for this app is uh, um, is for Windows. Uh, Terrence is asking why the fourth generation Intel processor. Uh, I, I'll expand on that a little bit. What I was saying here is that when you look at the data volume of a 1080p RGB, and then you're adding depth data to all of that data, you really need the processing power that you have in that fourth generation processor to be able to not only do things like gesture recognition and facial recognition, but also on top of that to be able to run a full-on game, um, an app, or whatever it is you want to do. If you try to use previous generations of processor, it really didn't have the performance needed to be able to do this smoothly. So it's that's just the, the simplest answer about this is that it's needed because of the, the processing 
requirements for this kind of op, 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 operation. Um, yeah, so we'll, yes. All right, so moving along, I think we've, we're, we're keeping up with the questions pretty well. Uh, Magna or Colleen, if you guys need to jump in, let me know. We also are supporting things for, for example, the web and HTML5. We do think that's going to be an area that's going to be interesting for people to, let's say, to scan faces and give uh, a particular, as an example, eyeglass company the ability to scan your face and tell you what, what frames would look very good on you, right, and do an augmented reality thing where they actually make it look like you're wearing the, the frames that they want you to buy, and you'd be able to get a really good sense as to how well they would or would not fit your head. Also, Unity is, is very, very popular. We've done several hacker labs so far, and people have very much enjoyed using the Unity environment to be able to rapidly create their, their devices, so that is there. Um, it does require the, the full and pro, pro version of Unity because there is a, a lot of requirements involved, but for those people that already have that, and they've, they've certainly been able to take advantage of that and enjoy that. Um, I'm actually going to jump forward a little bit here because somebody asked a question about the emotions. So I'm going to try and jump forward to that part and then come back to where I was in the presentation. Okay. So when we talk about facial detections, right, a couple things is we can track up to four faces at a time knowing that that's a face. And only one of those four faces at a time can have actually the landmarks. So you can do that kind of interactions with them. We can do things like head orientation. We, we use a fancy word to pitch you on roll, but really that means, you know, nodding your head, shaking your head, or moving it side to side. These are some of the examples of the landmark, right? Things like the eyebrow, the eyes, the jawline, the, the nose line, lips, and things like that. And then here are the emotions that we're starting to work on initially, right? Anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, and surprise. We are certainly much better at determining whether the person is overall positive, like happy, uh, uh, you know, joy and whatnot, or versus overall negative, angry, disgust, and whatnot. So these are the areas that we're trying to, to work in and getting better. Uh, I'm over 80% humans, and sometimes I can't tell what the person's emotions are. So you can imagine how hard it could be for a computer. But uh, Diego, I hope that answers your questions. If not, let me know. But these are the ones that we uh, we have going on right now. Uh, so Richard is saying that uh, the, the, he feels that the non-pro version of Unity works. I, I don't want to get into argument, Richard, but what I'm the the answer that uh, Brian put in is is right. You know, in terms of some of the DLLs that we've had. Um, we, we know that people are going to run into problems, so we want to be really clear about that. Um, if you've found out how it works, uh, then great, but uh, our experts have figured out that we really do need that. Um, guys, are there any questions that I need to jump in on? I'm trying to read them and talk all at the same time, which can be proven a little bit taxing. Um, Yeah, it's just the longer the question, the longer it takes all of us. So um, be patient if you wrote a long question. We'll answer the short ones first. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a question that Richard's asking about object tracking. And unfortunately, in the version of the SDK that you guys have that you were using for this challenge, object scanning is not part of that SDK. It'll be coming in the R2 release that, I, like I said, is hopefully going to be coming out by late January of next year. So um, we don't really have those details in it right now because that's that's an aspect that we're still working to, to improve on. Uh, yeah, so in terms of gestures, um, let me jump back to some of the gestures that are built in. For the hand recognition and things like this, these are the skeletal uh, enumerations that happen, right? When you hold your hand up to the, the real sense, it will look at and try to determine all of these various points. Because it is, it is actively scanning the hands with IR, it is able to do this much better than, say, just a pure RGB kind of situation. And then in terms of some of the hand gestures that are already being supported directly, things like hold, hold, holding your hand out into a big five, the V sign, 
moving your hand in and out towards the screen like you were trying to tap it, uh, waving at the screen, maybe to get its attention or something like that. Also, the, the various versions of pinching, right? Your two-finger pinch, your two-finger pinch with your, the rest of your hands open like an OK sign, and then a full hand pinch when you're making like a duck bill type of thing. And we also have things like thumbs up, thumbs down, and making a fist. So those are the, the, the uh, 10, I think 10, gestures that we have built in to it. Uh, you can see some of them are dynamic, like tapping and waving. When you want to start making your own gestures, some guidances that we offer, right? If you can have your hand open, things like this, then that tends to be much better. When you start to put things in front of other things, like an occlusion, like your crossing of the fingers or whatnot, then that makes it a little bit more difficult because obviously the IR can't scan anything through. It doesn't, it's not actually a vision, so it can't scan through your front finger. Also, holding things like a pen or a lollipop or whatever it may be could make it confusing, and also touching your hand to your face. That'll, that'll make things confusing because it'll mix in two different modalities and confuse it. From a two-hand standpoint, right, you can definitely do two hands at the same time. We've had people do this. But again, as we mentioned, when you start to have a lot of overlaps, a lot of occlusions, that makes it more confusing for the computer. So you should try to avoid them if you can. Um, yeah, so to when, you, when, you, when you look at how does the camera you get the depth data, it is using what they call um, a coded light. It is using, uh, the, to be very technical about it, it's using what they call pulse, pulse compression modulation, PCM, which is the same kind of technology the military has been using for years in its radars and whatnot. And so it is being able to use that data um, as it sends out the coded pulses and receives the information back. And one of the issues that we have, because it is a coded type of IR pulse, is that this technology cannot be used outside because the natural IR of the sunlight will swamp the IR sensor. So that is something to keep in mind. Uh, you should be working on these things for, to be an internal type of thing. Um, I think it feels like we're pretty caught up on the questions. Uh, Ryan, Magna, Colleen, any questions I need to jump in on, or should I jump back to where I was, sort of? I think go back to the presentation would be great. Okay. Uh, yeah, feel free to jump in if there's a question um, that uh, we're missing out on here. So one of the things that we definitely want to make sure that you guys are aware of, because we're really glad that you were able to come and attend this webinar with us and, and spend some time with us, which is great. But obviously, it's going to last for a finite period of time. Once it's over with, if you have more questions, we have one URL that we point you to, software.intelecom slash RealSense. Once you get to that site, it has all of the information you could want. All of the information that we have regarding RealSense technology from a developer standpoint is all contained within this one URL. Things like code samples, blogs, links to how to actually download the SDK if you hadn't already update your firmware, whatever else you need, to need, it's all going to be derived from this one URL. Um, and other thing that we do is we do go to some shows, we go to some hacker labs that we've been doing, and we do have a Share Your App Showcase, right? So here's another important aspect. Once you're done with this challenge and you've got your app in and that's great, maybe you win the prize, maybe you don't win the prize, but you can also put your app into your sh our Show Your Apps Showcase, and that will help give you visibility so that when RealSense systems start to come out later this year and certainly a lot more early next year, you can be one of the very first people out there to be doing the app that you made. When we talk to developers very often, it's like, I can code very well. I don't need you to help, help me code. What I need is better publicity, better marketing, better, better awareness, because they, they say that, uh, um, that that's one of the areas that they, they sometimes feel challenged on, especially when you look at very full and perhaps even flooded markets like Android and iPhone. As I mentioned before, everybody that got a camera off of this challenge are one of the very first 2,000 people in the world to get access to these cameras, so that gives you a significant hands up. Um, Anita, you asked a question about what are the trade shows and the labs. Uh, we have the events that we have been doing we had posted them up on that URL, right? And when we have more trade shows coming up in 2015, we don't have any more trade shows left in this year. 
but for example, we'll likely go to things like GDC, we'll likely go to things like Augmented World Expo, and so as those events are approved and added to our, our list, we will put them up on that website. Um, what countries are we in? We have the ones that I'm attending are the U.S. Um, there were five in Europe, and that I know there was at least one in, I believe, India, one in China, and one in Japan, and maybe one in Brazil. Um, what is the name of the labs? The labs aren't an actual lab. It's not a, it's not a place you can go to. When I say a hacker lab, I mean it's an, a, 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 an event that we do for a day. So, for example, the last one that we held was actually in Austin. Uh, it was a, in a place called the Capital Factory, and it's a, a co-working space there. And so me and some of the other folks went over to Austin. We had uh, training in the, in the morning. Basically, this slide deck that you see here, we went through in most of the morning, and then we gave people an opportunity to work on some code, and if they... Uh, at the end, if they were able to get some good codes, they were able to win some prizes. So in a lot of ways, these, this webinar, this first one and the second one, is all of the meat, if you will, all of the main content that the, the Hacker Labs have been holding. We're just doing it now on a webinar so that people that may not be able to get to the specific locations like Austin or Orlando or whatnot can get most of the same content. So obviously, we'll have online resources. Um, but one other thing we want to point out is that people that are outside of Intel have really started to take note of the Intel RealSense technology, and we feel that they've been very impressed with it. Uh, pardon my French, but this, uh, this person, Luke, here said that, in his opinion, RealSense is freaking awesome. So, excuse my potty mouth. But um, so with that, um, I think that's a major aspect of the, the webinar that we – in terms of the actual content, uh, we do definitely want to be able to interact with your questions. Uh, oh, wow. Colleen, do you speak Spanish? Uh, I'm, I just used Google Translate, and that's what I'm going to use for the reply. So here it comes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was like, wow, I have no idea what she just said. Um, yeah, so if you're going to post your questions, just please post them only in English. We don't speak other languages. Um, no, no Klingons, no Vulcans. Oh, I do a little Vulcan, but, uh, you know. Um, okay, so uh, some of the other aspects maybe to talk about a little bit, besides the gestures that I've already built in and some of the guidances, right, one of the things to keep in mind is that the, the, the camera itself is going to be scanning it roughly around roughly 30 frames per second. The other aspect to keep in mind, this is very important, is very much like when the first touch screens came out, right? It was a major shift in the developmental guides of people that made apps to not think of interacting with users from a keyboard and mouse perspective, right? The more simple, fat, round buttons you could put on a screen, the better they, they were, right? The ability to put a finger on a button and hold it down and have other interactions come up from that was much, much better than having some sort of pull-down menu like you might have had more commonly in the world of a mouse and a keyboard. In that same way, try not to just think of gesture as being a turning someone's hand into a mouse, right? You've seen that maybe in the very first versions of Kinect, for example, is um, you would, you'd have a situation where they'd want you to pick a choice, and so they'd have your hand hover over a particular menu item and then close your hand, and then as you close your hand, a little counter would count down to make sure you wanted to select that. That is a very much a, a, a mouse and or touchscreen type of user interaction. What you might want to do is things like if you wanted to give a user, let's say, three different choices, have them simply hold up one, two, or three fingers, right? That might be a different opportunity. Um, the more you can not think of things in the old school mouse and keyboard or even touchscreen perspective, but actually make the gestures easier, like I was saying before about nodding your head or shaking your head. If you want to ask 
the, the person if they want to do this or, or not, not, yes and no head shakes and nods are probably the simplest and most natural way people can interact. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Richard, you're asking a question about is there a way to add new words to the dictation? Um, oh, actually, I was going to say no, but Brian, Brian or... Brian what? or the Jack House. Brian or White House. Yeah, I'll follow up in writing, Eric. Okay, good, because uh, one of the things that we will say is that while the dictation does somewhat work, what we found is a very fixed number of words, let's say something more like 100 or something, and I actually have a slide on this here. Right, if you, if you want to have a specific number of words, like let's say you were having a, um, a cooking, a cookbook app or something like that, right, where, you know, in terms of a kitchen environment, there are only so many different things you'd want to do, right? You'd want to maybe turn the page, turn the page back, um, you know, search and have them listen for a particular phrase like apple pie or something like that, close, close the app, things like that. The, the more you can have very specific commands, the better that the, the computer will be able to do it. Because when, you, when you're dealing with, and, and this is just a logical thing from a, any sort of computational standpoint, if you have 50,000 or something like that opportunities, right, over 50,000 words in English, and every time somebody says the word pineapple, right, it has to compare and try to uh, 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 estimate the word pineapple versus all the other things that might sound a little bit like it, like cranapple or something. I'm not maybe, maybe making the best of examples here, right? But the, the more you can use commands, that's going to work much better. Um, Eric? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Wesley is asking a question about the uh, eye tracking, and uh, as Colleen has said, we're not currently tracking eyes yet, uh, per se. That is definitely one of the requests that we've gotten from people, is to uh, be able to track eyes. That, that is a logical request, and it's definitely being explored for down the road. But at this point, we definitely can't be supporting it. And it certainly won't be ready for the app challenge that you guys are working on right now. Um, one other thing to maybe talk about a little bit in general, and it goes back to the gestures a little bit, is when you start looking at having people use gestures, right? Again, this is going to be very much like the early, early days of touch screens, right? Where people weren't used to using touch screens, and very often apps had to, and a, and a great example with a, with the game, cut the rope, right, where it would show you very clearly, hey, drag your finger across the screen on the rope, and you will cut the rope, right? And you'd have a training aspect to many of the games because using touch screens wasn't originally the most, most intuitive because it, it was new to people, right? In that same kind of way, when you start looking at doing things like even facial recognition or gesture recognition or whatever, is you should probably look to have some aspect of training in your game and or feedback, right? So for example, if you are, and this is a picture at the bottom right, right? Maybe have some sort of feedback so when the person, the user's hand leaves that volume, right, from 20 to, to uh, 120 centimeters, then maybe let's say the border or the right border of the screen in this case when you look at it below would turn red or something, right? So they could have a feeling that the, that the hand went too far to the right and was now out of the field of view because obviously the upside of the IR beam is that it's not a weird color and no one's going to get thrown off by it. The downside of it is obviously infrared is not visible to the human eye so people can't see the volume, right? It's not some mysterious hologram area that they know that to, to move their hand around inside of. And so because of that, they can't tell necessarily when their hand has left the, the field of view. And so if you can give that kind of feedback to the user, maybe the border turns red or something like that, then that gives them a better interaction. So being able to train the users and give them feedback so that they know that they're keeping their hands and whatnot in the, in the right area, that will probably help with a lot of things as well. Um, Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you mind if I just lost, uh, launch the, the polls right now? 
Yeah, that would be good. Now let's okay. So we're going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, make sure we're, we've caught up on the questions. So we've got a few questions that uh, Alex is going to run through here. That'll be polls that come up. And uh, Alex, why don't you just take it away and start running the polls? All right. Thanks a lot, Eric. So yeah, basically, guys, um, just taking a, a very short break uh, to ask you a few questions. So yeah, we have like four questions. So it's uh, quite important for us to know about you uh, uh, and to um, to get these answers. So yeah, if you can uh, quickly go through them, that would be great. want you to vote, we can see how many have voted, so we need to get the vote up a little bit so we go to the next question. Yeah, basically, Colleen, if you, if you see some question, you can keep chatting, I mean... Interesting. So almost half the people haven't yet started on their uh, their apps for the challenge. So Joel, uh, you're online, right? Yep, I'm here. Joel, do you want to? Uh, I hate to sound like a, a cheesy game show host here, but uh, you want to tell the the audience what they could win if they enter one of the rapid development rapid prototypes before December seventeenth. <laughs> Okay, well, a lot, of, a lot of you guys, when you got your camera, you had a flyer in there, right, announcing the early demo submission bonus. The bonus is really uh, $1,000, right, US dollars, and we have uh, prices for uh, at least 80 of these, right, so 80 of you developers who can submit before December 17th, and then based on the scores, you know, uh, based, on, based on the highest scores, we'll select uh, 50 of the highest scores for early submitters on the Pioneer track. And 30 of the highest scores for submitters, early submitters on the uh, on the ambassador track. So, so those those are 80 opportunities. Again, it's a, a very low hanging fruit. Uh, you submit the uh, a lot of this is is stated the same kind of a submission you do for the final demo submission deadline. But submit early by the 17, and you can avail of these uh, 80 uh, 80 opportunities to get a thousand dollars each. And again, important point is that you can submit early by the 17th, and then you can continue to refine the demo for the uh, final submission deadline of, uh, I think it's around February 13th next year. So back Sorry. to you, Eric. Yeah, this is basically right, the, the, the last, yes, this is basically the last uh, question, guys. So, um, last, all right, once we, are, once we are done, I think, Eric, you can, you can go on with your presentation. Okay. Thanks Great. a lot. So, yeah, Thanks to everybody. Oh wait, are we done with the last poll or are we still working on it? Uh, still working on it, but uh, soon be finished. <laughs> okay. But audience could keep typing questions if you have any. All right, we are done with the poll. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we, we covered a lot of the content already, and one of the areas I want to get into is uh, we, we we sort of got really close to this, but uh, I want to finish talking about it a little bit in terms of um, you know what what you can do with the the facial recognition components, right? One of the, or at least four of the, the obvious ones that we think are, are likely that people will start to use is if you've ever played a game like, let's say, Solid Snake or some of the Splinter Cell games where it's not just about a first-person shooter, a lot of it's about sneaking around and whatnot, you could actually have a situation where as the person tilts their head, the character in the game will sort of respond in the same way and peer around a corner. 
uh, as one type of example, right? Uh, another one that's very common, as we mentioned before, might be a situation where a hat company or glasses company or whatever, or just a funny kind of let's, let's make silly pictures type of app could be a situation where Uh, did my screen just go black? Uh, no, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. We, we can't see what you're sharing right now. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't know why, it just it kicked me out suddenly, so I'm not sure why. Let's see Alex, we're still seeing the white screen from the beginning. Can you get him back in? Yep, yes. we can see his screen now. Yes, now we can okay. see. Thanks All a lot, right. Eric. Okay. Thanks a lot. I, it just popped out suddenly, I'm not sure why. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so things like face, facial augmentation is what we're calling it here, right? So that you could see what, uh, maybe even things like a different hairstyle, right? One of the interesting aspects of this technology is because we are using the IR scanner, and I, I've actually had developers actually experience this themselves in real life, at least for the men, right? The IR goes through a beard. So if you if you had a situation where somebody had a beard and you wanted to give make an app where they would know what it would look like if they suddenly shaved their beard or mustache or whatever, you could do that relatively easy because the IR scan doesn't get interfered with by hair. Or maybe you'd have a different app where you might allow people to see what different hairstyles might look on them by effectively scanning their head and the quote unquote removing the hair, which would be relatively easy, and then putting fake hair or augmented hair or whatever you want to call it, virtual hair on so that uh, we would know what Brian would look like with a mohawk, which I've always wondered about. So Brian, don't fall asleep anywhere around me if I have clippers. Anyway, another interesting aspect from a facial recognition standpoint is we found that when people play role-playing games, right, our, our RPGs and whatnot, a lot of people will spend a fair amount of time making their avatars look almost exactly like them, just a little bit better. And so in terms of real sense, you're going to have a situation where effectively we can very quickly jump ahead and make the avatar sort of, you know, the, the, the default look very much like you, except as an elf or a Klingon or a Vulcan or whatever the game may be. And, and then you, from there you can adjust it, maybe change the hairstyle or whatever else you want to do. And the other one is what we're calling effective computing, which might be a situation where you could be watching how people emotionally react. So one example might be a situation where somebody makes a, a game for children that you want it to be a little bit spooky, but obviously you don't want to give the child a nightmare, right? So you want to, you, you want to have something along the lines of, you know, a, a, a Mickey Mouse Halloween special not a Friday the 13th, and so they could be, the, the app or the game, whatever, could be watching the child's reactions facially, their facial expression, and keep things, you know, you know, somewhat scary and engaged, but not so much that they're, they freak out and they get all upset and whatnot. So these are the, the types of things that we think could be very, very interesting. Uh, Richard, I think your question got answered really well, but just to maybe reiterate it slightly, um, this camera right here, this board, this, this sensor, is going to be built into the bezel, in other words, the frame of things like all-in-ones and two-in-ones when these OEMs at the bottom start to make these systems. So the quote-unquote consumer version of this camera won't be something that gets plugged in at all, right? It'll be built into your laptop or all-in-one just like webcams are today. So, yeah, you won't have to worry about cores because it'll actually be built into the system implicitly. And the only reason that we've made these cameras available at all is to give developers a jump start. There should be no, quote, unquote, consumer versions of these plug-in cameras, or at least that's the plan right now, is to have no consumer versions of the camera. These cameras are only going to be used to, to seed developers so that you guys can get, a, like I said, a jump, jump ahead on your code development. Um, yeah, Anita, can you give us a little bit more context as to what you mean by a database support? Like, is there a particular database or usage that you're talking about? Where I'm, I'm not sure we're 100% clear. Uh, obviously, if you wanted to do something like, uh, let's say, um, scan faces for, uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, 
company directory or something, and you want to take each of these scans and put them into a database, the, the data that you pull off of RealSense will just be like any other kind of data, and then you could put it into any database you wanted if you had the ability to add that, that kind of that that uh, that data type. Yeah. So the uh, yeah, I, you can connect to basically any database you want. Like I said, at these. There's, no, there's nothing intrins intrinsic about it. We're not, we're not, we don't have, like, let's say, direct support for SQL or whatnot. But all databases are basically like anything else. They're just containers that you place data in. And so once you take, let's say, a, a, fa a face scan or something like that, that just becomes a, a bunch of ones and zeros of data. So you can put that into any database you want, but we, it's not necessarily something intrinsic we're doing. Yeah, you can definitely use databases in your development for sure. Uh, if you were doing some sort of story, like uh, as we were saying before about where when a child reads a book, um, as the child starts to read the book, you wouldn't necessarily. One of the, the, the version that I've seen is basically the child will hold the book up to the camera, and the camera will basically look at the title, uh, you know, the, the cover. And apparently, they, that old adage of never judge a book by its cover is wrong when it comes to real sense. You will, in fact, hold the cover of the book up to the camera. The camera will scan the book and go, oh, that's Jack and the Beanstalk versus Charlotte's Web or whatever. And then the child can start reading the book once it re registers, that, yeah, which story that we're on. So that was the, the version of that. Um, does the SDK support arm tracking and spine tracking? Um, OK, for, for sure I know that we're not doing spine tracking yet. That is more of a full, more full Skeletal tracking is something that has been requested upstream. Right now, we're only basically doing the hand scanning that I showed here. So this is the 22 points of articulation that you see. Um, we're not even really necessarily scanning the the skeleton, if you will, of the face. We, we are using the landmarks, but that's not necessarily like, obviously, there's no bones in your nose. Um, where that's just, just just cartilage. So we're, I mean, we're tracking all that stuff. In fact, a lot of the the things that change on a facial recognition is actually more muscle than anything else. So, is there any plan to include the SDK into the Windows 8 apps SDK? Uh, yeah, that might come in the future, but we're not there yet. Yeah, so the, so that is a great question, uh, Jaka, and that's one of the feedbacks that we've had is that uh, the early versions of the systems are going to be focused on things like laptops and all-in-ones, right? When you look at the the current state of the desktop market right now, and it's just a, a market market discussion, a marketing discussion, to be honest, what we find is the standalone desktop market isn't growing anywhere near as quickly as the all-in-one. The all-in-ones are becoming a very, very popular subgroup for a num number of different reasons. One, basically less systems, right? Your monitor is your computer. Your computer is your monitor. One less thing you have to worry about, one less set of power cords, all kinds of things like that. Uh, some of these will actually also fold down horizontally. Some of them even come with batteries, so you, you can use them temporarily, not even unplugged, right? So you could have like a, a family game night and play one of the board games as, a, as an app on them. So all the ones are growing popularly. There have been questions, that, again, feedback that we've, we've gotten from people of being able to put real sense camera technology into a standalone monitor that would plug into a desktop. So that is something that's being explored. But for right now, the only thing I can say that is uh, definitely plan of record is for it to be built into all-in-ones and two-in-ones and laptops and things like that. Yeah, I, 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 I see your I definitely see your point, Richard, in terms of uh, you know being able to allow uh, from a game developer thing. The example that I've seen people actually do is to take Oculus Rift and actually I think they actually use duct tape to be honest put the camera duct taped onto the Oculus Rift. It made for a very interesting application because basically the camera would scan your hands in front of you. And I actually saw this at last year's Augmented World Expo. And the Oculus Rift, it was basically like you were playing your own personal version of asteroids, right? And you would be smacking your hands at the asteroids as they came to you to protect yourself. So um, 
that was that was interesting. Uh, so I think Magna asked, answered the question about uh, luminosity and whatnot. The two aspects to keep in mind about that is the IR sensor obviously in and of itself doesn't require any light whatsoever. You could actually technically make some sort of quasi I don't want, I hate to use the word night vision goggles, but something like that, right? Uh, there have been times when people have, have done that, and you can actually see a fairly good detail of a face just because of the dif differences in depth and whatnot. But then, uh, obviously, if you wanted to do things like the RGB aspect, like let's say you wanted to actually see a person's face, and obviously the lighting is going to be as important for this as it would be for any other webcam. So lighting is, is going to be there if you plan to use the RGB component. Uh, is That's going to be key. Um, so we've got about nine minutes left. Uh, we're, we're getting some good questions here. I think we're having some good interactions. One of the things that I want to mention, um, go back to this real quick, is this call will end, but our support will not, right? And so if you do guys, if you guys have questions after the fact, or if you, you know, two minutes after the call is over, you're like, oh, I should have asked about this, right? We do have forums right now. They're very active. There are lots of people that are in the challenge that have been asking questions. And so feel free to, to go to those forums and ask your questions there. We have people supporting them all the time. We definitely want you guys to feel very well supported. As Joel mentioned, we are extremely interested in getting you guys in for the, the, the rapid prototypes, right, the early submission deadline. We're, we're, we've got a, a fairly nice bounty, if you will. Um, uh, so Jack is asking a question about can we use the camera in non-real sense, and the answer is absolutely yes. We've seen uh, not non-real sense, non-PC. We've definitely seen some people do some very interesting things. We had uh, um, a particular person, Martin, who made a very interesting robot where basically it was a laptop that was strapped on the back of a Lego's Mindstorm robot and then used perceptual computing camera, which is what the technology was called before it got named drill senses here, and to be able to avoid things like obstacles and whatnot. So uh, we definitely see our people are doing all kinds of really interesting things in the world of robotics, or another person had, and obviously they're going to continue to work in this, we're using the real sense technology, the gesture recognition, to allow people to very fluidly uh, control a quadcopter aerial drone. Right, we had this actually showing at a few different trade shows, and so you would sit there and use your hands, like in a thumbs up position, and be able to steer the, the drone around the room and whatnot. Um, yeah, so uh, the answer about a thick jacket and whatnot is really, really no. Right, so when uh, when you when you look at what it's going to be able to do in terms of background removal and things like that, it can very very clearly determine what it's seeing in front of itself, right? So it's going to know your face. Uh, if you go back to the landmark, the, the the landmark data, right? There's a lot of detail going in on, on this face here, right here. That 78 points is very, very complete. And because it, it's not just an RGB data, but it's an actual active scanning, like a, like a radar type of thing, it knows exactly where, let's say, the tip of your nose is. Right. So even if you leaned into the camera by a foot and leaned back out of the camera by a foot, it can adjust the background that it removes as you move your head in and out. Um, obviously, the jack is the same type of thing, right? It's going to be tracking your, your, all of this stuff and removing everything, let's, let's say, is a foot and a half behind your nose or something like that, right? These, these kinds of things are, are a, a key advantage of using this kind of IR scanning, right? Because it's not just an RGB where you're trying to do rely on technologies like edge detection and other algorithms such as that. Like if I use this picture as an example, right? And this is obviously a drawing, but you can see that the person, what seems like a lady to me, has that dark blue outline, right? That is from an from a algorithm standpoint, what is often used for previous versions of of virtual green screens was effectively edge detection. Now we're actually able to actively scan you and take out anything that isn't you because it can tell by our, from a rain standpoint, from an actual hard data standpoint, that the person walking behind you or the picture on the wall behind you or whatever it may be is too far away for it to actually be you and removes it automatically. So that is definitely a key attribute and a key advantage of this type of uh, 
active tracking. All right, so um, I'm going to put it back in the slide just so that you have the URL in front of you so it's going to be ingrained into your heads and you won't ever wonder what it was again. Um, Ooh, uh, Magna, I know you've done some uh, work on the actual performances of the SDK in various scenarios, so we're going to ask you a question about if there is a gain in performance by using the raw data API versus a hand tracking API. Do you want to try and address that? Sure. So uh, specifically what we have seen with the, um, the camera and the SDK right now is the performance is good if you were to use single hand scenarios, but it will actually drop significantly if you were to use complicated two hand gestures or if you were to use hand tracking together with other modalities like facial detection or voice detection. So approximately about 30 frames per second is what you can expect to see for single hand um, scenarios. You could clean up our samples and get better performance than our samples. They're not optimized for performance. So you could um, do some of your own code and get better performance than our samples get. That makes sense. All right, so uh, yeah, so one of the questions Albert's asking, hey, Albert, welcome back. I remember you from the first one was can all the examples that we've talked about be done in Unity? I, I really hate the word all because it's a very conclusive thing. Um, so I, I'm going to say that uh, probably most of them, people have been able to do a lot of things with Unity. Um, like I said, I, I hate to, to, to jump on the word all and make a promise that, uh, that we, you know, what they what the old adage, right, make a, making a promise that your body can't cash, right? Uh, but yeah, a lot of people have been able to do some pretty amazing things with the Unity. Um, I, I definitely, I, um, we will be sending out these slides out uh, through the distribution. Yeah, so uh, one of the aspects that we're going to ask here is in terms of uh, some of the aspects will stand out more when it's closer to the camera. Um, one of the aspects to keep in mind is that this will obviously be the actual tolerances and accuracies of the, of the IR technology is actually an angular, not necessarily a, a, a linear resolution, right? So the closer your hand is, let's say, to, the, to that 20 centimeters, the smaller the relative actual arc length of the angular um, uh, tolerances are. So uh, that stuff will come into play. The closer you get to the camera will definitely affect how it looks. Um, so, Alex, with that, we are coming up on the top of the hour, so I think maybe I will turn it over to you, and uh, yes. you can close it out. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, and thanks to all your team as well. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, Megana, uh, uh, Joel, Brian, uh, here with us uh, today. So, uh, thanks to you guys also, obviously, in being part of this webinar. I hope well, we really hope that was helpful for you. Um, I've been recording the whole session, so I'm going to put it uh, uh, online on YouTube uh, uh, in the in the few upcoming hours. And uh, and yeah, I think we are done. Good luck for the for the following guys. Uh, um, so yeah, it's uh, the final row of work. So really, once again, good luck. And uh, yeah, any feedback or uh, on the, any forum or anything are more than welcome. Thank you very much. Bye bye all. Bye bye.